Okay. <laughs> Let's go. Yes, you can start. Okay, good morning, everybody. So welcome to the panel business model for online contents organized by Art Electronica. So I'm Nathalie and with Thierry Beaujard, who will come and drink with me the, the session. So we're very happy to facilitate this one year session. Uh, we'll learn, in fact, how to make money. So, and how platform-based access to online contents can be financed, creates revenues, and how it guarantees income for the artists and contact developers too. So these issues are all the more important as the COVID crisis uh, is disrupting our access to culture and creation, as it is changing the business models usually put in place for the cultural and creative industries. Before we start, uh, I'd like to uh, briefly introduce our panelists. Uh, all of them are entrepreneurs. All have questioned the issues I've just mentioned. So we are very happy to have with us Alexandra Atamonovskaya. So she's uh, the director of partnerships at Dot Art. So with a background in consulting and software sales, um, then in art business, uh, Alexandra specializes in introduces new solutions in the art industry and is interested in establish an ecosystem for digital art. We'll have after Ulvi Kazimov, and Ulvi Hi. is an art director uh, and a venture capitalist. In we'll see that in 2016 uh, he launched Dot Art and the new digital domain for the arts world. Then we'll be very happy to hear Sabine Semo. Uh, Sabine is an entrepreneur, a researcher, an athlete, uh, many things, and also a technologist. So she conceives products at the intersection of sensors, data, and the body. And she will present initiatives she launched, uh, such as Poly. Uh, Poly. Our fourth speaker will be Brandon Checo. So Brandon is the founder and CEO of Cuseum, a platform that helps museums and cultural organizations engage their visitors, members, and, and patrons too. And he holds five patterns uh, in the area of mobile technology. Before giving the floor to our panelists, so I'd like to introduce uh, Thierry, so the co-moderator of these sessions. So Thierry is consultant on the digital crossover uh, European project and CEO of European Investment Network in India. So Thierry, I give you the floor. Thank you very much, Nathalie. Uh, I'm going to share my screen to do the presentation. Can you see it? Yes. Yes, it's OK. OK. So um, yes, I'm very happy to, to, to be here and to co-moderate uh, with, uh, with Natalie this, uh, this uh, panel about uh, business models. Um, so to give you a little bit of my background, um, I've been working for the last 20 years in, uh, in the financing and funding of, uh, in the creative sector. And uh, I've created about uh, 10 years ago now um, a pan-European investment network in Europe specialized in cross-border financing for um, uh, the creative sector. I think I'm going to put it like that. I think it will be better. Can you see it? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I did that. And um, yes, we try to, 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 to work on developing investment and financing in early stage for the creative sectors. And until now, we've been trying to, to focus more on four sectors. Uh, the audiovisual, video game, music, music tech, and fashion tech. And as you can see, I think we will discuss that uh, uh, today in the panel. It's, it's a lot about business model derivated from uh, the digital shift, because obviously um, now we're going through all this change of having all this creative sector uh, going digital. And uh, the question is, what does it mean in terms of investment and, uh, and uh, monetization of this uh, creative sector. And I'm here as well to, to represent uh, an EU project uh, financed by the European Commission, especially by the, the media program, uh, Creative Europe, uh, where we started just um, a few months ago, which is called Digital Crossover, which brings different types of partners from different sectors. So you can see there different people. So you have Centrica from Italy, who specialize in let's say, via immersive content, uh, the Börsenverein Gruppe in, uh, in Germany, 
which is the, uh, the Frankfurt Book Fair. INZ, for whom I'm, I'm consulting on that, who is uh, the, the, the center for music and media, so anything to do with performing arts in the audiovisual sector. Ars Electronica, of course, uh, our host today, and uh, ISNEO, who is a streaming platform for comic books coming from France and, and developing across, uh, across Europe now. So the idea was to, to bring these different types of, uh, of companies together to explore this kind of new approaches and, and through innovative technology and really looking at two points, monetization and really distribution and promotion. That's really what we, we are going to, to, to work on during this project uh, that will end in, in June 2021. And uh, what is interesting, I think the two points we, we would like to, to go through with this uh, project and uh, this panel for me uh, today is really about how can we learn uh, from the different uh, subsectors of the creative industries in terms of business model? Is, are there any business model we can find in some sector that can be replicated or adapted to other uh, sectors? And the second part, which I think is very important, is through this digital change, uh, are we going to find new business model? Because, for example, uh, one thing that we, strikes me always is that, for example, audiovisual is going, has gone through a very strong digital change, and still the business model is still based on, you know, traditional licensing model, for example. And uh, so I'm, I'm very interested in that, in seeing whether this new idea is going into this digital uh, paradigm will really open to new types of business model. So I give it the floor back to, to Natalie to, uh, to start the different presentation of the people. Thank yeah, you. okay. Maybe just, just two words about uh, uh, the Altec Foundation activities. But what I'd like to say is, in fact, we see with your short presentation, Thierry, and we'll see uh, with your presentation or the panelist presentation that that uh, that we will now tackle, that the cultural and creative industry field is very, very broad and should not be limited to a narrow definition of culture and, and creativity. And um, in fact, when we launched the Arctic Foundation, so I'm running the, the foundation um, from the very beginning, for we launched this initiative in 2017, we were convinced of the need to bring together different worlds, which traditionally uh, doesn't fit together or doesn't meet uh, together. And these worlds are culture, technology, so we, were, we, we, we talk a lot of digital, but Technology is not only digital, uh, we'll probably see later, and entrepreneurship. And this is why we have created uh, a community, so with the Arctic Forum, with also the Arctic Prize, uh, competitions for, for startups in the field of our culture tech, if we can uh, define it like that. And uh, our objective is to explore new cultural and, and creative fields and to support entrepreneurship, which is not so easy, in fact, or depending on the country where we, you, uh, we are. We are. Uh, so the support or financial support for these type of startups are not so easy. And so after five, four years, four years, so we have uh, identified more than 500 uh, startups in Europe, a little bit in, in, um, in the US, unfortunately not so much in, in Asia, but we know that it exists in Asia. That meets our criteria and cover demand Dimension, and this is my point now, uh, as diverse as gaming, archive, uh, archive, archiving, sorry, heritage preservation, music, sound, fashion, the arts market, museology, just to name a few of the sectors we, we, we work on. And uh, so it means that we are seeing also that the diversity is also encouraging the implementation of, of diverse uh, business models. And um, sometimes this Diverse business models uh, can be also based on new technologies. We talk a lot of blockchain, for instance, and uh, this is something which which uh, is very interesting. But I don't want to take too much time now. Let's and uh, continue the discussions with uh, with you uh, entrepreneurs. And for the audience, we unfortunately we can't see you, but uh, we uh, would like to tell you that if you want to uh, ask us questions so please don't hesitate so with the zoom um, um, uh, uh, during the sessions um, so i'd like to introduce now uh, alexandra and uh, the floor is yours alexandra 
Thank you, Natalie. Um, thank you, Thierry. And thanks to Arts Electronica for having us today. Uh, so I'm Alexandra. I'm tuning in from the home base of Dot Art from London. I know that many people came from different locations today. Um, as some of you may know, Dot Art is the digital domain for the arts community. And today I'll have a little brief overview of our of our product, of our business models, and also of some of the initiatives that we take part in. And then I'll give the words to our founder, Ulvi Kasimo. So I'm gonna share a little presentation right now with all of you, one second. So here we are. Uh, so Dot Art, um, we facilitate um, the digital onboarding of different members of the arts community. And by that, I mean, we protect and strengthen their digital brands and we allow them to find the right name as well. Uh, some of the products that we have are the standard and premium domains, domains with art records. We have the digital twin domains, trademark names, and blockchain, blockchain wallet domains. Uh, I'm going to briefly cover each one of them. So one of the most popular one, uh, as maybe some of you are using, maybe you've seen Arts Electronica using, are the standard and premium names. And on this slide, I am going to show you the essential breakdown of how widely they are used. So, for example, our community right now is over 80,000 people. And interestingly enough, 93% of that community are using star standard domain names, while only 7% are using premium ones. So what exactly are standard and premium names? Um, when the domain zone was launched, we were faced with quite a big undertaking where we had to decide on what exactly would be the pricing and how would we price unique individual names. It's like pricing the whole English language. And we were aware that there are cyber squatters out there. And let's just say the arts community is not always the first adopter of new technologies. So how do we make sure that the right people get the right names. So the right name to the right hands was the essential mission behind breaking down our pricing between standard and premium. And so to do that, uh, we used a big data collection um, and analysis approach, and we developed an algorithm, something that you can read in more detail on our website. And I, shall, I might not go into the full technicalities today. But using the algorithm, we were able to determine a comprehensive 10-tier model uh, in reality, we almost had 3.5 million names priced individually, but we had to sort it into categories so that it would be easier to introduce it to the audience. And the premium names essentially are more generic, uh, shorter, more popular names. And the standard names are those that typically look like your first name and your surname. Um, Using those names, different brands and artists could really pick up any, um, any right name. So what we then did is we realized that because we can use the domain name system, we can introduce more different solutions. Uh, one of them is something which we refer to here as the art records. The art records allows you to add extra fields of information into the who is fields when registering a domain name. An example here is a domain name with art records registered for the Car Brulov album of drawings. The art records are based on the object ID and it is something that is also reflected in our um, digital twin, which I'm going to come back a bit later. But essentially, the object ID is a system developed by the J. Paul Getty Trust. And it's a system of identifying an object by key indicators, whether it's a maker, date or period, or the type of object. This way, for example, if you're an, we introduced some examples. So say you're a marketing agency or an art ranking tool and you want to register a product. You can enter all the information about the product and then also upload it on the front end, say any images. So another thing that we offer uh, among our domains are trademark names. And in reality, we are actually offering a special program and special terms. So say if you're, um, if you're a charitable foundation and you have a name 
registered in the trademark office, you can approach us to, uh, showing us that you have that name and we would be able to offer you special terms for the long run. Here is an example of some of the brands that are registered with us, but in reality, there are hundreds and thousands of other brands that have registered in the first even months. What sometimes brands do is actually register packages of names. Um, so you can say amazon.art, if you type it in, would point you to the page on Amazon that's actually using creative products or selling paintbrushes. Um, that's just another creative way for brands to point to different sections of their website. Um, moving forward, we also have the blockchain wallet domains, something that we introduced um, fairly recently. And um, again, without trying to go into too much detail, Ethereum system developed the Ethereum naming system. And what it allows you to do is name your wallet. So say you want to transfer a smart contract uh, or make a blockchain transaction to someone's Ethereum wallet. Typically the name of that wallet is a long string of characters. You can see here in the concision point paragraph. Um, Ethereum name system allowed people to be able to actually put a short readable name to their wallets. Uh, what we've introduced is actually an integration with the .art domains, and by registering a .art domain, you can name your wallet with the name of your .art website. What are some of the benefits? The immediate benefits is that, again, you repeatedly show consistency of your brand. So you can have an Instagram handle, say, alexandra.art. You can have a website, alexandra.art, and you can have your wallet name again, alexandra.art or the name of your company. And you introduce consistency and simplicity across all of your um, branding. The .art digital twin is another product that has been especially popular um, recently as we introduced the .art and Arts Electronica Partnership. I'm gonna mention it just after, um, after this. And .art digital twin is using the system of art records where you're able to register extra object ID fields to a domain name, but also it, on the front end, you automatically generate a certificate, whether it's a certificate for a net artwork, whether it's a certificate for, again, a collection of drawings uh, or a new media artwork. The benefits of um, the digital twin is that you can actually in real time have any amount of images or videos that you can share with anyone. Because as we know, some of the more traditional ways of registering works, you, you can't just pass on a piece of paper with your certificate all the time if you want to show a video or keep transferring files. So um, Digital Twin offers you to just share a link and the other person would be able to check out your piece of art and download the certificate straight away. Um, so how do we go about introducing the tools and helping the digital community, and especially in monetizing um, their content. Some of the things that we've been rolling out was the fact that the digital twin can have donation buttons. It can also allow you, sorry, the sunshine is like shining right in front of me. It can also allow you to add licensing. It can allow you to add any type of information that could help and facilitate you monetizing that exactly piece of art. Uh, one of the great partnerships that we would like to highlight today is actually the partnership with um, Ars Electronica. As some of you may have checked out, uh, yesterday launched the Ars Electronica.art Global Gallery. And within the framework of the partnership, we offered every single participant an opportunity to register the digital twins. And if you visit the gallery now, you're able to explore almost a hundred of different digital twins, all having the key information about the artist. Um, just before I pass on the words to our founder, I wanted to show you quite a little breakdown of the different members of our community. Yeah. And uh, uh, Alexander, sorry, because the time is really running. Yes, <laughs> on this wonderful note, yeah, I- it's great. Yeah. Can you Can you just, um, yeah. Uh, or, or Ulvi would like to intervene now uh, so that we can have just one question maybe, or I'm sorry, Alexandra, do you want to just to finish? But uh, Yeah, no, I think on this note, I'm, I would pass on the word to Ulvi. Okay, Ulvi, can you? Can you yeah, on? hello, everybody. Uh, very fascinating <laughs> presentation. <laughs> Thank you, Alexandra. Uh, actually, for, for making our uh, time spending more efficient, 
uh, maybe we can uh, start uh, immediately from uh, uh, some questions. It's uh, easier to, to continue now. Okay, yeah, so, I mean, I've, I've been looking at, at what you do and I was wondering exactly about what you, where you finished, Alexandra, about the monetization model, because if I understand, uh, at the beginning, what you present is more like services you offer to, uh, to different uh, companies and, and people, uh, but you started talking about this monetization model, and I think that's what I would be interested to see whether the, 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 all the, the facilitation you bring to this, uh, to these people who want to use dot uh, art, uh, how can they can they help them to monetize their uh, art? Um, so, what do you offer there exactly, and how does it work? I think mm. that could be interesting. Uh... Actually, I expressed uh, in, in, in many articles in, in our website and uh, in, in, in my account in LinkedIn, uh, there are many ways. From, from the scratch, uh, I just got uh, an article in books uh, section, uh, New Yorker, last uh, issue. Uh, how can we pay for creativity in the digital age. Very interesting article. Uh, actually, it, it's uh, uh, another uh, angle uh, of, of, uh, of your question. And uh, it's a very interesting explanation what artists have to do in, uh, in digital age. Uh, most spend a dis, uh, disproportionate amount of their time effectively running a small business, focusing on winning their attention. War through the overlapping trio, self-marketing, self-promotion, and self-branding. Actually, we are uh, focused on, on helping them yeah. for, for this three trio. First of all, uh, uh, in, in one of my article, uh, it, it was, uh, uh, I tried to explain that uh, everybody is very uh, uh, familiar with a brand like a Google because the company spent 20 years, some tenth of billion dollars and technology, etc. And after 20 years, everybody knows what does it mean Googling. But if you can uh, look on art as a word or as an umbrella brand, it is uh, impossible even calculate how, how big was, uh, were funds invested during the history in that word meaning mm -hmm. as an as a umbrella brand. So uh, uh, nonsense.com is still a nonsense, but nonsense.art is not a nonsense because art changed its meaning. Actually, that idea lays uh, in uh, as, a, as a fundamentally in, in our big big data algorithm because it, it was a, an attempt how to measure meaning. So that's the first. So by adding, so it's really name, on visibility, really visibility. It's what you. You, you, you yes, of course, because uh, art gives a, a, a very uh, big and profound uh, uh, branding uh, uh, valuation. And uh, so we just uh, providing that uh, umbrella brands and trying to provide it to, to the right hands by, by uh, sophisticated pricing model because of uh, rules, uh, we cannot uh, uh, manually restrict access to, to domains. So by, but by our pricing uh, policy, it's, 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 it's possible. And uh, another, so uh, that's, that's how we are helping mm -hmm. to, to, community and uh, we see that it's, it, 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 it works. So concerning our business model, it's, uh, we have uh, several businesses in sight. So from uh, very traditional cash cow, uh, yeah. 
domain names with all that renewals, which is very stable. Yeah. Uh, as, a, as a business, as a company, we are uh, profitable uh, from the second years of uh, existence. Great, yeah, yeah. So thank you so much, Ulvi and, and Alexander. It's my pleasure. We probably have time uh, at the beginning of the at the the, the end, sorry, of um, uh, the sessions to discuss together about these um, uh, business models. Um, so I, I'd like to to let you, Sabine, now um, uh, take the floor. And uh, Sabine has pre-recorded a presentation, so we will stream it now, and then we can discuss together. I'm Dr. Sabine Seymour. As a technologist, I conceive products at the intersection of sensors, the body, and data. And as an economist, I create new business models and data cooperatives using distributed technologies to empower citizens to gain financial value with their data. I do believe we need a new economic model for data in particular because most of the data capital is captured by just a few very large data companies. When you make a PayPal payment, 119 data points are generated, which go to 709 different companies in 66 different countries. A stone PayPal account where a payment is made of $1,000 to $3,000 is worth 320 US dollars. Hacked Facebook account, 75. So why do I believe to first set up a data cooperative in Europe? First, we do have GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation that was implemented in May of 2018. We have 150 million co-op members in Europe. We as citizens do accept cookies. We know the messenger app is insecure or our data is lost somewhere in the ether, but there's no alternative right now. At Poly Poly, we are building that alternative. Poly Poly is building the technical infrastructure so your data never leaves your phone. It empowers members of the data cooperative to have full data sovereignty to decide when, if, and to whom to provide access to their data to receive a financial remuneration. We created the Polyverse. The Polyverse is set up by three entities. It is a decentralized data ecosystem. The data cooperative where members participate in the governance and financial wealth they create, the Poly Poly Foundation that proposes a regulatory framework for the fair use of data, and the Poly Poly Enterprise that monetizes data insights without infringing the data sovereignty of members. When you receive a payout as a member, Poly Poly Co-op receives a percentage for the use of the technical infrastructure. It also has its own features like the membership feature that can be sold to other cooperatives, clubs, associations, NGOs. So the PolyPod is a standalone application. It is downloaded on top of iOS or Android, your cell phone. That's why we build IDE, a developer environment that allows startups, designers, developers to build on top of the polypod to build a feature using building blocks. So one of the features will be super. Using data for good to democratize healthcare. It basically captures biometric and environmental data from wearables and other IoT devices. There is no longitudinal data, particularly lifestyle data, that shows the impact of our environment on our health or disease trigger points. At the same time, there is no digital real-world evidence application 
that allows to monitor a drug that has been released, and even today with COVID, a vaccination and its impact on our health. We at Polypoli and Super are building a new economic system for data. Please join us. Thank you. So thank you very much, um, Sabine, for this presentation of Poli Poli. So you, we will continue the discussion. I have a first question. In fact, I, I understood and we'll see that you have a, a, a business model. Uh, you have a lot of people in, involved in, in uh, your projects, so technologists, uh, uh, artists, developers, et, et cetera. And, and in fact, how does it work? How, how, how and who makes money, in fact, in, in your model? So basically the model is comprised of uh, a data cooperative, the enterprise and the foundation. I wanna focus on the data cooperative or the cooperative per se. So basically um, as a cooperative member, if you now become a member of the Holy Poly Cooperative, you automatically receive a payout if you decide to share the data that you have generated. So, meaning that if you share the insights or provide access to, uh, to your data, you can monetize it. So, that is one. At the same time, you as a cooperative member, you receive a dividend at the end of the year because you become, quote unquote, a shareholder of the cooperative. So, that is for you and that is for um, people that become members that generate data. So, pretty much everybody, right? So everybody has now an incentive to become a member of the cooperative to um, provide access to their data and thus create um, or basically benefit from um, the um, monetary value that is generated. Now, the data cooperative, of course, needs to provide the technical infrastructure and we use edge computing, distributed computing to actually do that. And that is very costly. So what we do is we basically build that infrastructure we built a polypod that you can download um, on your cell phone and then provide um, content providers, car creative artists, um, everything from a healthcare provider to, uh, to uh, um, you know, a creative um, that potentially ex exhibits it as electronic and the ability to develop an app similar to what you currently you know, know as an app. And also you have the opportunity now for the co-op to charge a certain amount for the access to the data. That means also from the actual members, um, they receive the data, like let's say 100% of the payout for the technical infrastructure, they pay also a certain percentage. So as a data cooperative, you also receive uh, uh, in, in, you know, basically a revenue. The other revenue stream is because we are developing certain features that need to be developed for the cooperative, like a membership feature or so, those are uh, sold to other cooperatives, to other clubs, to other, um, you know, associations who currently have, you know, Excel spreadsheets, you know? So what we provide is a direct access to all their members, but then also because they are part of the poly poly ecosystem to the entire population that actually has a poly poly on their phone. So it's basically, um, you know, a little bit to also what Alexandra and, and Oldie had explained. Um, there is also this huge ability to have direct peer-to-peer -peer access to all these uh, partners. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and maybe just a question because uh, so as I understand, you you launched the initiative. Uh, yeah, several what? When when did you launch the initiative? It's, it's so quite the recent. The or? First day we started thinking about it uh, last year. So okay. it. it yeah. And sorry, you hear the church bell. So I'm literally in the garden in Austria. So, <laughs> uh, but again, you know, we have church bells here. Um, so there are a few different uh, opportunities. Um, going back to your question, um, the the launch, the initiative was launched last year. Uh, we uh, literally a few days ago received um, the registration for the data cooperative 
and uh, we will be launching uh, the pod next year. So we are right now um, also, um, you know, looking for content creators, partners, um, you know, investors, um, co-op members, and so forth. Um, and Super has been around for the last few years. Um, and we basically, um, like I had said to Brendan early in uh, when we had our private conversation, I, I went to Europe two years ago because of TTPR, because that is a huge USB. Um, so we are completely GDPR compliant as a company. So every partner, whether that's B2C, B2B, or whether that's a member, whether that is, you know, an association, we are, all the offerings that we have are GDPR compliant. Yeah. Uh, what's your, oh, sorry, Jerry, yeah, no. Jerry. No, sorry, I just, I, I was very curious uh, because it's very, it's very interesting concept, this poly poly, I think. But I was wondering, how do you work on the, education of people to, 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 to decide to give their data to one or to another. Because, I mean, today you have cookies, so everybody are on the same level, I would say. But what you are, you, are, you are saying, which I think is very interesting, is that people can decide to who they want to give it. But what about education? I mean, if what happens if everybody wants to give it to, well, certain type of... Uh, of company, of association, et cetera. And, and that could be a, an unbalance, uh, you know, a problem later. Well, it, not necessarily because, um, so it's an interesting question, education, absolutely. And that is something that we thought of right from the beginning. Uh, we call it polypedia. So basically, um, as you has met, have, have seen in the video, we really do research as to how much is the data worth, how much can you get, to where does the data come, which are the companies um, you know, um, that provide access to data, which are the companies that are using your data for what, where, and how, so that you as a consumer, quote unquote consumer, or you know, data generator, you are educated about that. And then you basically can make your own decisions. Uh, we definitely, um, in, in, and that's a UX, UI question, right? Uh, how do we actually um, you know, um, uh, create that onto a phone, onto an environment that it can yeah. actually be consumed easily? Absolutely. Um, the other is how we actually um, are working also on, uh, um, advertising, quote unquote, uh, the system per se, the platform per se, is also by the sheer fact that you can basically um, provide content um, uh, as a feature on top of the polypod, uh, similar to what an app is currently doing. And you have access to all these uh, members uh, worldwide, or at this point, we are developing it for Europe. So this is an important factor also for us to basically get the word out, uh, because everybody who develops um, is actually, you know, also promoting, um, you know, the, the, the access. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, wait, my question is, um, in fact, what's your dream, in fact, in, in four years or in five years? How many people would you like to have or how many data or do you have an objective or a concrete objective? For yeah, no, we have, we, de we definitely, internally, we have a few. So, um so, and that's me now personally, right? So I'm one of one of many uh, within Poly Poly. Uh, so the founder, uh, um, Torsten Dittmer, also has has his vision of, of generating uh, basically a, a complete new data ecosystem for Europe. Um, so it's very important for him because, um, you know, the data is currently lost, uh, you know, to, to Silicon Valley. Um, as we know, there are, you know, all the, pretty much the largest uh, companies out there that generate huge amounts of data. Um, China is, of course, a big player um, and really bringing uh, the data ecosystem and, and the economic value of data back to Europe. So that is a, a big, uh, um, you know, uh, thing that, uh, Torsten is is very very keen on. Uh, for me, um, it's basically also um, a very similar model. Um, but for me, also what I want is in five years is that we don't Google but we poly. No, oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, very nice conclusion. Yeah, so uh, so well to the audience. If you have any questions, please just send your questions via uh, Zoom. We'll take the questions uh, at the end or, or during the presentation. So don't hesitate. Um, I'd like to uh, give the floor to Brandon now. Um, so Brandon, the, the floor is yours. <laughs> 
Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Brendan Sieco. I am the founder and CEO of QZAM, tuning in from Boston, Massachusetts, where it is six o'clock in the morning. So I'm up right and early to join you. Frankly, I wish I was over there in Austria enjoying a cup of coffee and a croissant, but maybe next year. So what I'm going to do for the next 10 minutes is kind of walk you through the journey um, as a founder in the art, technology, and creative field. So I started my first company when I was around 13 years old. I've been designing and developing creative products since the age of 11. Used that as a way to break into the music industry and was working with the likes of Mick Jagger, Katy Perry, and Lenny Kravitz before I could legally drink alcohol. Um, all of that said, I learned a lot about business and business models, designing and developing and managing teams. And I wanted to shift my attention to a far more sexy, fast paced and lucrative market. So of course, naturally I turned my sights to the museum and cultural world um, as I saw incredible um, opportunities to really open up this space to people like me that really didn't have access to arts and culture throughout the early years of my life. And so from a personal perspective, I really had this blossoming interest in the power of art and culture and wanted to find a way to help unlock that value of experience and knowledge for, for all. So this quote has always stood out to me. I mean, it's a classic Silicon Valley quote that software is eating the world. Truly no sector or industry is immune to the disruption that technology has brought to us. And that of course includes museums and more traditional institutions. But if software is eating the world, I like to think that culture is feeding the world. It's nourishing the soul. It's giving us so much value and meaning in our lives. And I wanted to find a way to merge those two worlds together through, through tools, through technology. So that le uh, led me to found uh, QZAM in 2014 with the mission and vision of helping the world's cultural institutions and arts organizations engage their visitors and be more successful in the digital age. So ultimately, you know, we are here to help cultural organizations engage their visitors, their members, and their donors using the power of technology. And I'll soon talk about what some of those tools are and what our journey has been to be there. And I think a lot of this comes from the frustration that I was seeing in the arts and cultural space during my early phases of customer development and understanding the sector is a lot of the technology didn't work. It didn't do what it said it was supposed to, and it certainly did not live up to today's expectations of technology and user experience design and intuitive function. You know, these are the clunky old audio guides of, of yester decade, and we needed to bring everything into the common smartphone era. So when we started the company, our goal was simple. It was to create a digital docent that was adaptable, flexible, and affordable for different organizations of different shapes and sizes. But our, our vision had since expanded from that point where we had started to work with dozens of organizations. We now work with hundreds of organizations around the world, ranging from your SF MoMAs to your White House, to your Seattle Art Museum, to all types of organizations in between. And to talk a little bit about our evolution as a company, we started with one product, one value proposition, one area of focus, but we started to see different challenges that our customers were facing. And I think my word of advice to any entrepreneur entering a new field, whether it be B2B or B2C, is always have your ears and eyes open to your customer. You'll learn so much about what you should truly be creating and what problems they're facing that need solutions or a new way of addressing them. So we started with mobile engagement, which was very much visitor focused. How do we create the best possible experience for the museum or cultural visitor? And then we started to hear something interesting for our customers. It was that their member departments, their membership departments, their development departments were spending tons of time and money and energy trying to engage and retain their member uh, constituency. And so we rolled out a product, which is now used by hundreds of organizations as well, that helps these organizations save time and money while increasing convenience and retention uh, of their members. And then from there, we wanted to find new ways for them to acquire new members and acquire new visitors, and more recently have rolled out a digital ticketing extension. So in a lot of ways, we're playing into these different 
departments and needs of those departments in ways that address not only engagement, but also revenue uh, acquisition and revenue retention for these organizations, uh, primarily museums, galleries, libraries, and uh, any type of membership association in the cultural space. So I wanna talk a little bit about my journey. So I think, you know, there's so much that has been learned. There are so many trials and tribulations uh, starting a company. So for my entrepreneurs and founders at home, you know, it takes a long time to build something to profitability and a long time to build your first product. But we started the company in August of 2014 and were quickly accepted into PayPal's incubator in Boston, the PayPal Start Tank. Uh, within months from there, we raised uh, about one and a half million dollars US and were featured in the New York Times for being this breath of fresh air in the world of digital transformation in the cultural space. And then not too long after that got accepted into Techstars, which is one of the most um, active and most selective uh, startup accelerators in the world, uh, which gave us an extra boost of capital as well as access to mentors and business leaders and resources to really hone what we were creating for a long-term sustainable run. Uh, and then, you know, not long after, we got our first paying customers. It takes quite some time to get to, you know, the first version of your product and to get people to actually pay for it. Um, but then soon after, you know, heads down, go to market phase, really learning about what works and what doesn't with regards to pricing strategy, marketing strategy, sales strategy, which we'll be happy to talk about during our Q&A. And then, you know, in, in the last couple of years, it, things have been kind of spinning in action in a really, really nice way. It's kind of running on all cylinders. We secured a partnership with Amazon Web Services and launched a project for the White House. We were featured in hundreds of publications around the globe around our work in augmented reality and immersive technology. We launched a product with one of the largest uh, contemporary art museums in the world, SFMOMA and so on and so forth. I mean, I could go in tremendous detail. I'll, I'll kind of touch on running the business through the pandemic. Uh, you know, we were on the right side of a lot of trends around digital transformation in the arts and cultural sector, rolled out a feature that allowed people to bring the art and culture into their own homes, making it more relevant and also allowing a new avenue to immerse yourself in the art while we were in lockdown quarantine. And that was featured globally. And then the icing on the cake is Apple made that their app of the day in different global markets. So we're always rolling out new products and new initiatives. We're a very experimental and agile company. And I think that is one of the you know, big drivers of our success in this market is we aren't set in our ways. We're always evolving by the things that you know, we are witnessing and seeing. And we are a for-profit company. Um, so we have raised uh, $1.4 million from some leading investors like Techstars, Foundry Group, and Accomplice. We're backed by the founders of Kayak, the founders of iRobot, the founders of Crashlytics, and some of the you know, largest, most successful kind of startup stories and technology stories, stories in the greater Boston region where we are located. And I think Boston has really ingrained this great sense of, you know, commitment uh, to the work that we do. Boston was, you know, 100 years ago referred to as the Athens of America per, you know, its deep-seated educational institutions, arts and culture, and innovation and business. And that dynamic, that DNA is very clearly uh, a part of what we do at QZAM. So shifting a little bit to our model, we are a B2B SaaS company. So SaaS is software as a service. We've built a product that's cloud-based. Uh, we license that to organizations based on different tiered models and different add-on features. So we sell our technology to museums, to arts organizations, um, to museums, aquariums, zoos, historic landmarks, everything under that cultural attractions um, segment. And they, in effect, bring that uh, product or tool directly to their uh, consumers or constituents. And that might be visitors, members, or donors. So in ways we're B2B, we could also be considered B2B to C, business to business to consumer. Um, and one thing I'll mention with regards to not only the cost savings um, to our organizations and the efficiencies and the automations is also that this generates additional revenue for our customers. 
So we're playing both sides of the ledgers and the cost savings, as well as the revenue expansion where our organizations are getting donations, they're getting membership subscriptions through their apps, they're retaining more members, they're driving fundraising initiatives and other monetizable things like their uh, retail, um, retail operations. So those are, those are some of the big points I wanted to hit on. I know we only have a couple more minutes, but I always like to leave founders and other entrepreneurs that are interested in the space with a couple quick words of advice. Find mentors as early as possible. If you're exploring a new business model, surround your people who have experimented or created new business models in the space that you're serving and, and surround yourself with a diversity of voices, not only by industry, but also regions. There's a lot of different perspectives, whether it be the Austrian perspective, the European perspective, the Boston, the San Francisco perspective, or the Asian perspective. So it's really important to surround yourself with mentors and experiment often. I think the most successful companies are those that are willing and open to pivot as quickly as possible when they start seeing you know, signs of a better tomorrow or a different type of existence for their product or their product suite. It's time to put some feelers out validate some assumptions and move quickly. Um, I do realize we're running up on time, so I will end there. And if we mm -hmm. have any questions, I would be delighted to answer. And thank you, Ars Electronica. It's been a joy um, and a dream of mine to be involved with, with Ars Electronica. So really excited to be uh, a participant in this conversation today. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Brandon. It's very in impressive. Um, Thierry, you have a question? Yes, I mean, thanks, thanks a lot. Congratulations! It's it's, it's obviously uh, very great what you, you you've been doing, and you know the, the development of your company, etc. It's it's very very nice. Thank uh, you. My first question is really about about Europe, because as you know, we have a lot of museum in uh, in Europe, and uh, the digitalization is is on the way for many years, but uh, still we 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 don't have so much. Um, I mean, there's some interest, definitely, but the, the, the process, I mean, because, of course, most of the, the museum and, and cultural institutions in, in Europe are public, and in the US, most of them are now private. Um, how do you see your, your, your development in Europe? How do you see how you can convince, even though I think the people are convinced, but how can you make this process easier for the, the European cultural institution to, to, to access this kind of product? Yeah, that's a great question. I'll answer it in two parts. I think more recently, uh, people have estimated that COVID-19 has accelerated digital transformation by five, six, even 10 years. And so the timing is absolutely perfect as cultural organizations and arts organizations look to consider what their presence and their involvement in the digital realm is. So we've had a surge of interest um, in, in other markets, I will openly say that this past quarter has been our best quarter in the history of the company. Um, there's really been wow. some driving momentum with all of the you know, transformation um, and transition to digital platforms within the cultural arena. With regards to Europe specifically, we do have customers in the European market, but our uh, growth strategy in markets outside of North America, even the United States for that matter, is around channel partnerships. So we have Amazon Web Services running campaigns in different regions. We recently inked partnerships with a, with a uh, European company that's publicly traded on the London Stock Exchange called uh, Assesso. Um, they're bringing our product into the European market. So we do have partnerships that are, uh, that are distributing um, our products into markets where they have a stronger uh, and, and long-held position, which for a company of our size and nature and funding and, and general makeup, is probably the best strategy rather than trying mm -hmm. to open up offices in different territories. So for mm -hmm. us, you know, regional growth is growth not only organically through inbound, but also through partnerships. But in terms of your, your pricing model and the, and the business model you are, you are using um, in, in, in the US, don't you think in Europe as well, you, you, you have to, to change that a little bit because of the fact that they are public, because that they are mostly non-profit and also quite, uh, you know, uh, got quite a lot of uh, funding from, from, from public money as well. Um, how, do you, how, do you, how can you adapt your business model to this European institution? I mean, okay, working with partners, I understand in terms of distribution is, is, is good, but 
do you are you do you intend to 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 adapt this business model you have to the European model and to this uh, this uh, institutions in Europe? And absolutely, yes, a a absolutely. I think when it comes down to pricing flexibility, there are some regional regional factors that are baked into that. You know, whether you're selling to Germany, which is you know one type of economic model, versus Ukraine. Um, or other European nations, uh, pricing needs to be flexible and modified and adjusted per currency conversion, as well as just the over. If you look at the, if you look at the per capita incomes uh, of some of these nations, there's a really large spread. So being able to have pricing sensitivity around those notions is really important. And so per that aspect, um, there's not only a pricing change, but there's even an approach change around trying to build more self-serviceable um, onboarding experiences so that the price can be adjusted in a way that is sustainable from a, from a business perspective. Okay. I mean, I don't think we have the time to discuss, but I think we should maybe have some, some room to discussion about that. You know, now we have a Eurozone, so a lot of, uh, you know, countries are on the same currency in any case, and I think in terms of differences of culture in uh, there are many countries now, I mean, there are groups of countries that, are, that could be much more, more similar now. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's something, but it's, it's very interesting. And many companies in startups in Europe are, are looking into that. Um, and it's, uh, it's a very difficult to market to crack. So um, yeah, we'd be interested to, to have further discussion. For example, with our partner from uh, DCO from Italy, who is really doing immersive content for museum, I think would be uh, would be interesting to to have some discussion with him. For example, thank okay, thank so, you. so thank you very much, Ben and Brandon. So we still have some time for global discussions. So I've been said that we have no questions from our audience, but if you have dear audience, so you can still. Uh, ask your questions. So I, I like, um, I, I, I'd like to open the discussions because we were talking just before uh, entering the session uh, together and, and uh, we, all, we know that we also have questions together. So somebody would like to, uh, to ask a question to another person or, yeah, Brandon. Yeah, so my question would be for Sabina. I'm really you know, interested with your model and the seismic shift that it would bring not only to enterprise, but the consumer. My question, uh, you know, as someone who's dabbled in uh, mobile app development for quite some time and I'm surrounded by others in that community, as you mentioned that you have an IDE, you have an environment for developers to roll out modules. Um, walk me through that a little. What's going to be compelling for the developer? What type of uh, programming language or framework? Are they gonna have to learn something new? Um, just kind of walk me through some of the things that might be perceived as barriers that might not be barriers and what the overall drive and appeal and how you're going to reach the developers is also a key component. That is an excellent question. So um, basically, just, just to give, give a little bit of context at the size of Poly Poly at this point, we're between uh, 30 to 40 people. Um, and uh, Lars Eilebrecht, for example, co-founder of Apache, is also one of uh, our uh, team members. So um, from that perspective, I just wanna be a little bit uh, transparent as to how much expertise we do have and very well to your question. Um, so basically what we are uh, trying to to almost, and, and again, this is my uh, language, and I have been in, in IoT for 25 years. So, um, you know, um, I wanna always be very clear about sometimes I use terminology that might not be applicable for, um, for, any, uh, for everybody. Um, think about almost like a WordPress, uh, you know, how easy it is to set up a website now. Um, so you basically have building blocks similar to, you can almost refer to them as themes. And thus you have the ability to very easily without huge technical knowledge, start building features on top of the, of the actual polypod. So that's, we wanna make it very simple for designers, uh, creatives, uh, different type of startups, whoever it is. So you do not need to build the technical infrastructure of the polypod that with all this implication that edge computing has, but that is basically a layer that you are building on top. 
So meaning that in terms of uh, how we want to uh, provide access, we are looking into accelerators, we're looking into building uh, cooperations and collaborations with different types of institutions, universities, very much so. That's why the foundation is also going to be a centerpiece of the polyverse, where we collaborate with um, you know, educational institutions with different types of um, you know, accelerators and so forth. So to give you a little bit of a framework there, um, you know, the, the most interesting idea always come from people that can uh, build on top of it. Okay. Um, so I, I have a questions arriving. Um, maybe, yeah, you, you, you can, uh, we can share these questions together. Uh, I think the question is to have uh, about how these business models that you presented uh, can, can spill over the other cultural projects or, or cultural or other cultural institutions. How can, can they be uh, developed? Um, and yeah, what can um, the cultural sector learn from each of of their endeavors. Do you think that you can um, imagine that other sectors you are in now uh, can uh, take benefit from, from what we're doing, all of you? Um, yeah, uh, Ulvi, yeah. May I? Yes, of course. Uh, actually, there are uh, several challenges uh, bringing uh, technology and money, of course, to cultural uh, industry because it's not real industry it's it's a sector of, of, of our life mm -hmm. but if we uh, if we would compare uh, art environment with another industries it's it's not the same so why because uh, initially in in uh, fundamentally they they weren't uh, founded as a, as a something which should earn money or develop some technology so it's it's very unusual if uh, any museum has a very uh, trained uh, IT team and 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 shouldn't and uh, my understanding is uh, uh, to create that kind of uh, simple instruments for uh, making that hurdle uh, lower than it is now. And uh, that's the point which is common for all that uh, our business models. They are different, but they are common in, in, in making that uh, hurdles uh, lower. So my understanding is, uh, as I, uh, my vision is, uh, the most important thing in, 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 in inside of, of cultural uh, world is, is an information because it's it's a very simple explanation all all that pictures generally content is an information and that, and again the question how to preserve that information how make it uh, uh, don't jeopardize ownership of that information from one side from another side give a uh, wide access to to the market to uh, like uh, Brandon or Sabine uh, developers get that information and and uh, give that solutions to 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 cultural world uh free actually because monetization comes from customers not from museums itself yeah exactly we have a question from the audience in fact um and the question is um uh, consumers have got used to free contact how hard it is to shift their expectations somebody have um, an answer uh -huh. It's not really free content. I mean, the, before uh, yeah. uh, Ulvi was talking about Google, for example, I mean, it's, uh, we think that it's free, but it's not free. And it's back to what Sabine is doing, basically. So exactly. I'll, 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 I'll leave you talking. Yeah, about. no, that, it, that is 100% uh, the premise. So basically giving the data sovereignty back. So right now, the data that you are generating as a consumer um, is not for free. 
uh, we are paying for it in so many other ways, uh, you know, in any case. Um, also, um, th you know, the data itself um, and the insights that we can generate are worth a lot. So you as a consumer uh, or as a data generator, you shall be empowered to also um, receive a financial remuneration um, for the data that you're generating because what you're doing is you're basically creating a raw material. And that raw material is basically taken from you and is monetized by somebody else. Um, you know, and you think that you can use WhatsApp and all of these things for free, uh, though they, the, the, what you're paying for is you pay for the data that you're generating and you pay for the time and many other you know, um, instances. So um, that is very much the idea. Um, and also, um, you know, to do that, um, that's why we were, you know, really brainstorming quite uh, a while around, you know, how do we set up? I mean, you know, Brendan is, it's a very interesting business model in terms of a, a very, very typical startup business model. So how do we do the enterprise? Okay, great. Then we have to do a B2B model or so. But then we were saying, well, how do, can we make sure that uh, the person that is generating the data is also receiving a financial remuneration. Well, they can become a member, let's set up a data cooperative. A cooperative is a huge, you know, model that has been around in, you know, Switzerland and Germany. And we, we know, um, you know, in Austria, we have, we have, cooperatives that that have been uh, uh, operating for many years, not for data, but for something else. Uh, and so now it's about how do we now shift a model that a cooperative is not something old school, but it is something where you as a member participate in the value that you create, really get money for it. I, I, we still have two minutes more, but not more. Brandon, please. I'll keep it, yeah, I'll keep it really brief. I, I think that there's been a radical shift in the way that we think about content consumption from the a la carte over to the subscription. And I think some of the most telling aspects around that outside of Netflix, outside of Amazon Prime and all of that is really looking at what Patreon has been able to do and other comparable uh, platforms. I mean, Patreon just raised $90 million on an over billion dollar unicorn valuation. And it really validates the idea that there are people out there that want to endorse you on a membership level, endorse you on a career or the body of your work level, rather than individual works. And I think that there's a shift away from transactional, or there could be a, a shift away from the one-off individual a la carte transactional to more of a loyalty model that's more holistic and supports the creator at the root of their work, not off of the you know, individual product that is produced. Okay, so thank you so much. We are at the end. So thank you very much for all of our panelists to, to, to have been with us. And thank you for to the audience. So we hope that you learn something. So together we will continue the discussions tomorrow, in fact, and we hope that uh, these discussions will help to develop new business models to uh, create also new uh, entrepreneurship. So bye-bye um, and have a nice day, all of you. Thank Bye. you. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Bye -bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Have a great day.